Information comes to you throughout your life. You know, the fascinating thing about it is that cannabis is not new. Cannabis is old. This is a plant that's called weed because it grows like a weed. How do we get the product to people who need it while at the same time avoiding some of those other issues? Amendment 2 provides an immunity from what would otherwise be the unlawful possession of a controlled substance. In Florida, marijuana is still a controlled substance. So this provides an exception to people who have one of the qualifying debilitating conditions that would then al allow them to get on the registry of medical marijuana patients. A qualifying patient has the right to possess marijuana as it's defined in the criminal statute. So it incorporates by reference the criminal statute which talks about the possession of a growing plant, the seeds and the derivatives thereof. The way it works is they've got the doctor. The doctor has to be specifically qualified to participate in recommending any kind of medical marijuana. You've got the qualifying patient. That patient has to have been established to have been suffering from one of those debilitating conditions. You've got the caregiver, obviously for people that need someone to help them out. And then you've got the medical marijuana treatment center which theoretically is the location where you get the different derivatives. So those, those are basically the four entities that are addressed in Amendment 2. These high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently they dance. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Medical cannabis has all of this negative story about it or I should say marijuana had the negative story, although if you go back in time you see it was always considered with, uh, as a medication since ancient Ayurvedic medicine, even in Chinese, they, they found it in, in a mummy that's 2,000 years old, appeared to be a shaman from China, and in his medicine pouch he had cannabis seeds, and clearly they were aware of the medicinal properties of cannabis. It was an accepted practice of American medicine until it was stricken from the pharmacopoeia in 1942. Two Bayer tablets bring all the pain relief power your headache can use. It started with the big pharma at the time, Bayer, realizing that they could distill opiates that were water soluble into an injectable form. And because opium is not able to be produced in the climate of North America, it would have to be imported so they could mark it up. They didn't know what to do with the cannabinoids because number one, it grew everywhere. And number two, it was not uh, water-based, it's oil-based. And they couldn't figure out how to engineer something to be injectable that was oil-based. This whole system. Uh, the other factor of prohibition at the time uh, was William Randolph Hearst. And William Randolph Hearst was the newspaper baron, but he also had timber interests. The sister plant of cannabis is hemp. Six acres of hemp in six months can produce as much paper pulp as 40 acres of timber in 20 years. Of course, Hearst was a timber baron. He saw the potential for hemp cutting into his bottom line. Perhaps the uh, most dominant part of the prohibition is a gentleman by the name of Anslinger. Anslinger was the commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Prohibition during the prohibition of alcohol. When the Volstead Act was repealed in 1933, he had a federal bureaucracy of 1,200 agents with nothing to do. He wanted to keep his job, so he teamed up with the pharmaceutical interests and the corporate interests of the time and started pushing forward with the devil weed. The first piece of federal legislation that led us to prohibition, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, when it was working its way through the Congress, it was known as the Anslinger Act. In the 1970s, uh, President Nixon, when they created the Controlled Substances Act, uh, appointed the Schaefer Commission to study um, whether or not cannabis and other drugs should be included on the controlled substances list. I would propose that anyone in possession of one kilogram or less of dried natural plant materials would be presumed to have this supply for personal use and would be guilty of no crime. Nixon chose to ignore the recommendation of the Schaefer Commission. I shall continue to oppose efforts to legalize marijuana. That said that cannabis should be legal and is medicinal. 70 to 80 percent of all of the drugs we use now were derived from plants. 
my ancestors as pharmacologists and physicians were the shamans. How they discovered these things wandering through the jungles and woods and then transmit it onto each generation is it's a remarkable thing. Everyone says, oh, medical marijuana can make you crazy, can make you paranoid. And, you know, well, it depends how much THC there is. And if you just modulate with the CBD, the benefits outweigh the risks. And that's the story of medicine. That's why we have two serpents, you know, and that poisons at the right doses are medicines. A medicine at the wrong dose is poison. Cannabis is a very complex plant. Hopefully, in six months, we'll be able to go ahead with the first clinical study at USF. There is no risk if you go through all of the legal procedures. It's, it's only risky if you try to cut corners, and you can't. There's three levels of bureaucracy that can all be handled. It's just slow. The FDA, DEA, and the local investigational review board. So there's no risk. The, the one risk you might have is that there are some people who think it's devil's weed, and they may send you nasty notes. But this is what happens, that, you know, I'm going to work with cannabis as a medicine. In general, we're miseducated about drugs. But the bulk of the people are becoming more educated about these things. Education is the key to everything. I mean, the more we learn about how the body works, how substances from the environment interact with the body to produce certain effects, we can start changing our lifestyle. First of all, no one knows anything about endocannabinoids in medical school, and we have to start teaching people about that. They know a bit about the endorphins that it's mentioned in passing. There's only one semester of pharmacology in medical school. It should be at least every year you have some pharmacology throughout medical school. The pharmaceutical giants, the people who develop drugs, it's very expensive to get a drug on the market. Um, they're looking at various ways to manipulate the endocannabinoid system with drugs. It, it's going to be impossible to replicate what the plant material will do. And there's all kinds of synthetic THC that's being made and it's easy to make and sprayed onto some herb and sold and causes tremendous toxicities. And that's the danger of just getting materials that have not been quality controlled. Cannabis, I think, should be allowed, it should, but it should be tightly regulated. And, and the quality control no pesticides, herbicides. Right now, if you get underground cannabis through, for the recreational source or medical source, you have no idea how it was raised. You have no idea how much fungicides they used, pesticides. The difference between medical and recreational cannabis is that in me medical cannabis, the formulations are much more careful. The detailing of, of the components is more careful and uh, consistent. The future is going to be understanding how these entourage of cannabinoids are beneficial, much more beneficial than just a single compound from the plant. I've always been interested in marijuana because of all the lies and everything that they've been telling about it. I never did let the government tell me what was good for me and what wasn't good for me. For my cancer, my uh, uh, stage four lung cancer, I won't take their medicine. Your medicine is not natural. Marijuana is natural. Uh, it has no harm. No one's ever died from marijuana. We have an opioid crisis going on right now. I got opiates at home, liquid opiates. I got morphine. I got all this stuff. I just, you know, they'll give you that stuff. You can kill yourself on them. When you're doing chemo, Chemo just attacks your whole body, it attacks your toes, your feet, your legs, everything, it just attacks everything. It's killing you, and they just hope it kills the cancer before it kills you. The marijuana makes it tolerable. I, without the marijuana, I might not have gone through it. And you see the sign right here, I got it up here. I might not have gone through the chemo and the radiation without the marijuana because it's really, re plus it allowed me to attack the, the cancer through my own body where opioids just take the pain away and that's the end of it. Just don't work that way. I smoked cigarettes, I drank, I did cocaine, 
And what other drugs did I do? I did about just about every damn kind of drug you could think of, okay? When I wanted to quit, I tried, and I tried, and I tried. I tried that cocaine had me, cigarettes had me, alcohol had me, they all had me. So I decided one day, you got to do something. And it just my willpower was not working. So I decided that when I, the least of these uh, drugs, the, the least harmful to me, would be the marijuana. So I decided to smoke a joint when I had an urge for to drink, when I had an urge to smoke a cigarette, when I had an urge to do cocaine, when I had all those urges, I would... Uh, smoke a joint. I did it and it worked. It worked. I did not want, it was fine with me. I smoked my joint. I didn't want the other stuff. And it really made it easy for me to quit all those things that had me by the neck. It worked for me and it will work for a lot of people. I want to juice it just so you can do carrots, broccoli, uh, fruit, just do whatever you juice. It's fresh. It comes right off the plant. So I want to do the same thing with marijuana. And it's, it's helped me. It's done me pretty good because uh, I'm 77 and I'm healthy. A growing plant to be able to juice it is illegal in the state of Florida. Uh, should it be? The, and it really isn't because the Constitution says I can possess a, grow, a plant growing or not and the seeds thereof. I mean, it says it. It's the Constitution. It's paramount law. I don't think they understand the place of the Constitution as to their power when they're passing legislation and making rules. If it's healthy for them, why in the hell is the government telling you you can't do it? They have these preconceived notions. They don't care what the public thinks, and they're going to do what they want to do until someone like me comes along and forces them to do something else. And I'm going to fight them the rest of my life. I went to law school in San Francisco in a time when there was a very strong civil rights environment at the time. So I became interested in the First Amendment and the entire Bill of Rights for that matter. When I came to Florida, I ended up getting a job for a guy that did real estate and bankruptcy law, which wasn't my first choice, but as it turned out, he had done the real estate closing on a restaurant that Joe Redner had bought and turned into a gentleman's club. Tom Little, who was my boss at the time, said, hey, how would you like to work with Mr. Redner and represent people from his club? And I said, as opposed to going to bankruptcy court, no problem. What the citizens of Florida voted on was the right for people suffering from debilitating conditions to consume medical marijuana in all its forms. There was no limitation in the ballot summary that said, we're gonna let you do oil and vape and some other derivative and some other concoction. It didn't say that, it said medical marijuana. One of Tampa's most well-known strip club owners just won his first legal battle against the Florida Department of Health. Joe Redner is suing for the right to grow his own marijuana plants. Well, this lawsuit was originally filed in mid-2017 in Hillsborough County. The Department of Health actually filed a motion to have it removed to Tallahassee, to transfer the venue to Tallahassee because that's where their headquarters are. And then they filed a motion to dismiss, and then they filed an amended motion to dismiss saying that we had no cause of action, basically the equivalent saying you have no case, what are you doing here? I myself was cynical about the whole concept of medical marijuana, thinking, yeah, right, it's just a subterfuge so people can get high. Since I've been involved in Mr. Redner's case and learned more about the issue, I've come to the conclusion that it's a really wonderful miracle drug for a lot of different maladies. It really helps a lot of people that are suffering in ways that are unparalleled by any other kind of a pharmaceutical. We believe everything in that record from those transcripts is entirely irrelevant given that there's no constitutional right for individuals to grow their own marijuana in Florida. And we said, that's fine, but the definition says that Mr. Redner can possess a growing plant. So just because there are terms that allow the treatment center a certain list of rights doesn't limit Mr. Redner's rights. All of those can be read in harmony. There's no aspect of Amendment 2 that zeroes out any of the other rights of the other entities, and the judge agreed with us. If you hold that individual medical users have immunity to grow their own marijuana, 
Ironically, you may ultimately cause the entire medical marijuana constitutional amendment, Ar Amendment 2, Article 10, Section 29, to be nullified and stricken from the Constitution. Litigation is litigation. I mean, you know, if A sues B over any number of different civil matters, you got to expect some kind of gamesmanship in the litigation. But when you're dealing with something as important as people's health, it's been a great surprise and disappointment to me to see such opposition to what clearly is a valuable medicine that could, could eliminate the suffering of so many Florida citizens. This is not the final stop of this case. Uh, the case will go from here across town to the district court and who knows beyond that. My name is Dr. Barry Gordon. I'm a retired emergency medicine specialist, now specializing in medical cannabis. Any doctor in the state can participate in the medical cannabis program. All you have to do is take a two-hour class, and every doctor in the state is allowed to participate. Unfortunately, too many doctors aren't, but I think the program that we have in Florida right now is working. What we want to do here at our clinic is be an example to all of how to do this appropriately with the appropriate amount of education and integrity. And, you know, we base our practice on a threefold tenets of patient care, education, and advocacy. So what we did was, you know, we kind of set it up like an emergency medicine atmosphere because we have people in the front that have the patients um, registered and signed in. They get the history for me, then I go in and do the physical exam and the teaching. And then we have other clinical teachers that come in afterwards. So this would be your typical examining room. And as you can see, we have a pretty good amount of show and tell here for the patients, especially for those patients that have never seen cannabis in their life. Of course, they're usually expecting to see a plant, green matter, flower, weed. Uh, but of course, in Florida, we don't have those products um, as of yet. I don't think that the state legislature really ever got past the vision of what the recreational market was. What we have every day are patients coming in looking for relief. So many of our patients that have wanted to be drug-free for their entire lives, they've grown up with the cocaine, the methamphetamine, the heroin. Cannabis, unfortunately, has been grouped in with those for so many years. It's still a federal Schedule I designated product. There's no accepted medical use or reason to even do research. But literally, those are the patients that are coming in carrying the satchel of pills. But to them, they're not drugs, right? Because they've been prescribed by their doctor. And to me, that's a failure of the healthcare system of today towards that patient, that a plant-based product that may be beneficial to them has been grouped in with the dangerous drugs. They want a product that they know exactly what they're getting, and I think there's reasons to bring people off the black market, off the street, into an appropriate legal medical cannabis program. These are educational issues that once again, I think once people understand the difference between medicinal cannabis and recreational cannabis, that it, um, it helps with a lot of those perceptions. My name is Patrick DeLuca. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Compassionate Cannabis Clinic. My beginning in medical cannabis uh, was November the 9th of 2016, the day after uh, Amendment 2 passed. I called Dr. Gordon. I told him Amendment 2 passed with a 71.2% majority. His response to me was, 71.2% of people can't agree on anything. And he said, what do you propose? And I said, I think we should start a clinic. This is a practice of medicine with debilitated and chronically ill people that have tried everything and have not received the quality of life improvements or symptomatic improvements that they expect and deserve. People need to know that uh, this might not be for everybody. Uh, we don't actively promote what we do. We're not advertising anywhere. 70% of our new patients come to us as referrals from other doctors that cannot practice this medicine. Our average patient age is 54 and a half years old. We see older people. I can't tell you in this practice how many people have come to us deathly afraid of cannabis that come from that era of prohibition that were told it was a gateway drug, that it was dangerous, that it would you know, lead you to a life of nothingness if you even took one hit off of a joint. 85% of our patients say that their friends and family members have noticed a positive difference in them. 80% of our patients 
report the elimination of one or more prescription medications since beginning cannabis therapy. And they come in here and they tell us how much it has changed their lives. Their spouses come in and they thank us for what we do because we've saved their marriage or we've given their husband or wife back to them. A dispensary is a location where patients can come and legally obtain cannabis products. Certera is a vertically integrated company, so that means from seed to sale, we are the ones uh, involved in the cultivation, harvesting, processing, and then finally the sale uh, or dispensation of the products. So banking has been um, an issue for many dispensaries around the country, being that this is legal on a state basis, but our banks are federally regulated. We try at every step of the way to dispel the stigma of medical cannabis in this country. The aesthetic and vibe of our store really gives off a very home-like and welcoming feel so that people don't feel that when they come into a dispensary they're doing something that's wrong. Cannabis is not a one-size-fits-all medication. Every patient is unique and the physicians are the gatekeepers of this process. So the physicians have a lot of insight into the patient's medical history and what, uh, which one of our products may be more therapeutic for them. My name's Teresa Miller. I'm a substance abuse prevention advocacy person. I try to help people better understand the dangers of misusing and abusing drugs from marijuana to prescription drugs to alcohol. Amendment 2 implied that it was a medicine and it's not a medicine and doesn't have those approvals. So many people thought they were voting for a prescription or something that was FDA approved. They had really no idea that they were just voting for basically a bag of pot to have a label medical on it. I class medical marijuana and marijuana in the same bag and I really hope the federal government enforces federal law and cracks down on all these states that have legalized it and honestly pulls some funds. It's described as a medicine and it's not, but I think also more importantly is its addictive uh, features and the fact that if you go to any uh, rehab or, or ask most people who are addicted to prescription drugs or heroin in particular, if they ever used it or what their first drug of choice was, it's often marijuana. Most of the medical marijuana throughout the nation contains THC. The CBD oils, how do they really know it just has CBD in it? Because they're allowed to market it as CBD or marijuana or cannabis without going through the FDA process, it's not, it's not only not safe, but it also is not um, consistent enough and doesn't have the valid um, data that they need and meet the benchmarks for a drug. So I don't think uh, pharmaceutical companies want to mess with it. It's more trouble than it's worth because I don't know too many legitimate pediatricians or other doctors that get involved with this because it's unpredictable and you write a recommendation not a prescription and you don't tell the person how often they take it, how long they take it, which specific strand they should use. I, I certainly would never give that to my child. Money talks and certainly um, a lot of marijuana, big marijuana as they call it, is influencing um, a lot of people in our state. I just really want to say I'm very compassionate about people who are in pain and have sicknesses and I can completely understand that they, for a lot of these sicknesses and all, want to find something to help their loved one. But it really saddens me to think that people are turning toward marijuana and have been given this false hope that it's a miracle drug. My name is David Berger. I am a board certified pediatrician. My practice is called Holistic Pediatrics and Family Care. I had to learn on my own how to dose herbs for children based upon body weight or based upon conditions. When we talk to families, when we're dealing with kids, when we talk to patients, we're talking more about how to introduce the different strains, how to introduce the dosing. There are what are called sativa plants, which are more stimulating, uplifting, and energetic. And then there are indigo plants, which are more calming, relaxing, and sedating. And then there are also hybrids, which are cross-pollinated plants that will have some attributes of each. There are two main active ingredients in cannabis. The cannabinoids are the chemicals. The main one that most people are familiar with is THC, what causes the euphoric high when people use it recreationally. The other main cannabinoid is called CBD. 
specifically more being used for seizures, um, for children in particular. And the biggest difference between the two is you can't get high from CBD. I have patients with multiple sclerosis and with Parkinson's, their tremors are reduced and have even stopped. People with insomnia who tell me they're now sleeping through the night all the time and without having to take Xanaxes and, and Valiums, and so they're not feeling all drugged up in the morning, they're ready to go. I'm very, very comfortable using these things, but I also have, as I said, I've had the luxury of using herbs for 20 years in children, and I know how to do this. I would have no qualms if somebody came to me with their year and a half year old child having seizures. The medications that we know that are used for kids in seizures, they have really bad side effects and they can affect cognitive function. They can cause all other kinds of issues people just don't know and so a lot of what we need to do is to educate people educate society that the reality is is that this is safer than the majority of medications that you can get at a pharmacy right now if I had to choose between whether I would remain as a cannabis doctor or hand in my DEA number, I would turn in my DEA in all honesty because I just don't use it that much and I realize that I'm serving a purpose for families that can't get cannabis otherwise as well as for adults because there's just not a lot of doctors in town who are doing this and there's definitely not a lot of doctors who know what they're doing. My name is Jennifer Mulry. I am the parent of a 12-year-old child with autism. My opinion on medical cannabis, it's it's a game changer. It's a lifesaver. It's been a miracle. Gabriel was diagnosed with autism when he was 17 months old. I knew by the time his first birthday rolled around that something was happening. He went from meeting his developmental milestones to regressing. What little language was there was lost. Fine motor skills started to disappear. He went from walking to crawling. His balance left, everything just kind of changed. My goals for Gabriel have never changed. It's happy, healthy, and to know that he is loved. And when your child is screaming and crying and in complete, um, it's, it's horrible, it was horrible. You start losing your mind along with your child. We are very, excited to be able to give Gabriel something that thousands of parents across the country, across the world, were saying we're doing these miraculous things for their children. We start giving Gabriel CBD and I thought I was losing my mind, but Gabriel became worse. And so that's where our story with medical cannabis is a little different. Gabriel cannot tolerate CBD. Gabriel takes what would be considered very high doses of THC for a child. I would have tried medical cannabis with Gabriel years and years ago. He's a remarkable child. He's come a long way. He's come a million miles in 11 years. My name is Ellen Snelling, and I'm a volunteer for the Hillsborough County Anti-Drug Alliance. We work to reduce all substances of abuse. The number one is alcohol, and then number two right now is marijuana. We fully support the research and the FDA-approved medications made for marijuana. I worked in hospitals with sick people, and I'm very compassionate about helping people who are sick, but I hate <laughs> using elderly people or children because you want to legalize a product that is addictive and abused because you want to make a lot of money. I'm not like a zealot or I'm not like ultra conservative and trying to keep people from getting their medication, but I think you just have to look at both sides and see that there are people who have been negatively impacted by marijuana. It isn't a completely harmless substance. The FDA takes a really long time to approve everything, but that's kind of their checks and balances. They're trying to make sure they approve it to, for safety and that it works. And even Florida, there's a lot of loopholes in our amendment. so. You can almost get it for anything. So like I know a couple of people have gotten it for insomnia and some people are getting it for digestive disorders. So it's not like it sounded like when it was passed, the way you read it, it's for HIV, AIDS, cancer, ALS, and some very significant illnesses, which I think a lot of people would agree that that's worth trying, especially if people have tried other medications. We look at the cost, what we call the cost. So what does it cost? In emergency room visits, what we call child poisonings, um, insurance increase cost, um, 
traffic crashes, all of these things. We're trying to get that information out of Colorado, Washington, California, so that we can give a, a complete clear picture of here's the benefits, but here's the cost. Yeah, there really are two sides, but it seems, I, I feel like the media um, supports marijuana legalization for the most part. So a lot of times, even when you try to find out, like you want to Google something, like the first two pages are going to be all pro. And that's why in our class, we try, we, we give both sides and we want to make sure that there's students that hear both sides because really on every topic, there's always going to be a pro and con. Our laws are representative of societal influence of the time. Well, at the time, the prohibitionist forces created what we like to think of as the most successful marketing campaign of all time. Because not only were they successful in getting cannabis prohibited in the United States, but they were able to get cannabis prohibited worldwide. In fact, in countries like Canada, that is descheduling cannabis, uh, they're having issues because every member of the United Nations in their UN charters has inherent prohibitions against the legalization of cannabis in the UN charters. The fact that Canada is descheduling and Mexico has descheduled, the United States is going to be forced to create some positive movement away from the Schedule One designation. Well, we already know it's good for the economy. Uh, maybe not in Florida because they haven't taxed it. They have in all the other states, and it's a bonanza for their economies. California and Colorado, booming, got money to do things that they've never been able to do before. And it comes from medical marijuana. What I tell people that want to get involved with the movement is to educate yourself first, and then tell everyone that will listen what you've learned. The Florida State Constitution gives you the right to try it if you so desire. There are still, you know, 29% of people in Florida that didn't vote for this, um, and they have their varying reasons, whether it be uh, their holdovers from prohibition, uh, whether it be they have financial interest to uh, keep the prohibition uh, continuing, uh, or whether it's just plain ignorance. The cat's out of the bag, and the 29 percenters are not going to be able to, to shove it back in. The more people that are touched positively and are educated properly on this plant-based therapy, um, the more the bricks of prohibition will come down.